Good morning, everybody, or good evening, good afternoon, whatever time of the, whatever time it is in the place that you are. Um, as with all these uh, live streams, it'd be awesome if at the beginning um, or whenever you see this, uh, you would uh, put where you're from. It's good to see people from all over the world come together for these and learn to automate things for together and and uh, do new things. Uh, you might notice today I am wearing a volleyball shirt. Uh, I don't know if you. Uh, enjoy the sport of volleyball or not, but it was my favorite sport in high school, and uh, I'm wearing this shirt in honor of all of the high schoolers especially, but anybody else who has missed out on their, their spring season of sports or music or arts or whatever kind of activities that they did and didn't get the opportunity to, opportunity to do this year. I know for myself, um, volleyball was one of the things that brought me back from, from uh, not quite depression, but I, I had... Uh, uh, some major issues with Crohn's disease. I have a chronic illness called Crohn's disease, and I got that in high school right before my volleyball season. It kind of knocked me down a few pegs and took me from being a very, very good volleyball player to being a mediocre at best volleyball player. I went, for anybody who knows volleyball, I went from being an outside hitter to being a libero, which is kind of like uh, if you were in soccer, being a, a field player to being the water boy in a sense. Um, but it, it was uh, it was something that really gave me, gave me the opportunity and willpower to kind of fight back and, and get my strength back after having a pretty rough go with that disease. And uh, still something I, I struggle with every day, but I know that that was a, a big thing in my life, and it, it's difficult seeing people not be able to have that, that year of their lives, uh, especially for volleyball for me, but for anything, uh, whatever it is in uh, other young people's lives. So Please always reach out to people, try to help anybody who might still be struggling, even as uh, some parts of the world are opening back up and having people go back to work and go back to different activities. There's a lot we still can't do, and uh, you still need to be there for other people. Um, today's episode is, uh, I'm excited about it because it's something that people have been asking about forever. I've had an issue open on my books repository forever, talking about molecule testing, and we'll get to that. Um, as with newscasts, that is the big topic, but it will be at the end. I am disappointed to say, but it, uh, we will have time to talk about it, and depending on how much we get done today, I might uh, make this a two-parter and have it also in episode eight. We'll see. Uh, but I wanted to start off uh, by thanking especially uh, the new GitHub sponsors and Patreon patrons who make this possible and who make it possible for me to spend more time doing open source work uh, Matt Glayman, uh, Dave Runs Co. UK, I'm guessing from the UK, uh, Matthew Cosgrove, um, Mark Grennan, and Deanna P. on Patreon. Uh, they have started supporting me this week, and uh, actually this week I've, I've added my support for a couple other people on Patreon too, whose work that I use often. And uh, I really encourage you, especially in times like this, uh, some of the people who do these open source things or contribute content for free, they rely not entirely usually but a lot on donations to be able to spend time doing these things and, and having passion projects that you might benefit from so please consider giving back uh, whether to me or other people that that uh, you rely on for their work and uh, it's great to see everybody here it looks like there's people from des moines iowa malvern england uk new york sweden uh, greece denmark morocco virginia london florida austria so awesome to see everybody here. I'm glad you could make it. And uh, if, if you haven't seen past episodes, please uh, feel free to go back, not during the live stream, because you want to stay here with us now. Uh, but if you can go back and see all the previous episodes, uh, one to six of the series on my YouTube channel. Another thing that I've uh, been starting lately, and I have the second video almost ready to go, is uh, a series on a Raspberry Pi cluster how to build a Raspberry Pi cluster, and in this case, using the Turing Pi. This is a prototype board, one of a kind that I got from uh, the, the Turing Machines company that is making this, and they're letting me test it out, and I wanted to uh, uh, do another video series on how to build clusters with Raspberry Pis, and specifically a Kubernetes cluster. And the next episode, I'll be discussing how to put together the hardware, and then another episode, I'll be talking about installing K3S on it. So. If you're interested in that, click subscribe below me. <clears throat> you can uh, uh, see all the new videos that I put out on the YouTube channel and also get notified when these live episodes come up. 
Uh, there were a few questions and, and uh, statements from last week's episode and from a couple other episodes that I wanted to highlight. Uh, one was from Baptiste MM. Any hints on uh, when a team works on the same playbook, is there a way to avoid password sharing? This was talking about Ansible Vault. Uh, there's, there is an option called Vault ID that, that lets you have multiple passwords sign one vault, and you can have different passwords for it. So uh, if you're interested in that, using Vault uh, with a team, that is one way to do it. Uh, Rolling Pictures asked a dumb question. This is not a dumb question. This is an excellent question. Do we need configuration management tools like Ansible if we're working in Docker? That is a, a very, uh, you're, you'd be surprised that's actually a very good question because there's a lot of different ways to approach that question. And I would argue yes, <clears throat> because Docker is one of many different tools in a full deployment and, and production pipeline uh, for applications. And it depends on where you're going with Kubernetes, with um, running Docker Compose, using Docker Swarm, or other tools out there for running the infrastructure and also testing things and building things. So uh, that's something that I'm not going to cover in a short answer here because I can't. But I do have a blog post on Ansible's blog, The Inside Playbook, that talks about uh, whether Ansible is necessary in a cloud-native environment. Uh, so I encourage you to go check that out. You can search Google for it. And I also have a book called Ansible for Kubernetes that begins with Docker. So, uh, and then also in chapter 13, which uh, I think it's, yeah, chapter 13, which soon will be chapter 14, actually, in Ansible for DevOps has a whole section on Docker uh, that you can, you can explore and how Ansible can help with your Docker workflows. Patrick Cole asks, and I probably butchered that name, should I structure the playbooks as roles or would you recommend doing collections? That's another thing that I'm not going to get into today. Uh, I'm actually reworking some of the content in the book to discuss collections, but it's not something that's really concrete yet, and so I don't want to write on a shifty foundation. I want to make sure I have enough time to understand all the different areas and collections that uh, could benefit organizing playbooks that way. So I would say for now, I would stick with roles, uh, and I'm keeping the book's content in this Ansible 101 series focused on using roles in playbooks. Uh, just because they're simpler, they're easier to set up, they're easier to maintain and manage. Uh, and we'll discuss Ansible Galaxy a tiny bit today, but uh, that has some implications too for roles versus collections. Uh, Stormwolf01 has been posting some comments on my videos with tips for beginners, which is awesome. <coughs> Please feel free to add comments on these videos with anything that you learn uh, that, that it would be beneficial to other people watching them in, in the future. But he mentioned that uh, if, you don't have, if you don't have an EC2 instance available or if you don't have an account on DigitalOcean or something like that, you can run VMs with Vagrants. Any of the examples that I have, they're meant to run on any server. It doesn't have to be on Amazon. It doesn't have to be on Vagrant if, it's, if I test with Vagrant. Same thing in the book. A lot of the examples might use Vagrant, but you can use those playbooks anywhere as long as you have the same kind of server. So if it's Ubuntu, have an Ubuntu server running whether it's a VM, whether it's a Docker container in some cases, uh, or if it's a, a EC2 instance, or even a bare metal server, you can have a server running at your house. You could even have a, a Raspberry Pi Zero running uh, using Raspbian, and you can target that with playbooks too. Uh, and Aaron Colby, and I might have butchered that, I don't know. Uh, how long are you going to continue live streaming past Device42 sponsorship? Well. I have to say thanks again to Device42, but their sponsorship is over. The books are no longer free for now, and uh, I plan on continuing this as long as I can. I just don't know. I, I know I, I have plenty of content, so uh, I know one episode I'm going to talk about securing servers, like the first five minutes on a server with Ansible, automating the security. Um, I have a, a chapter on um, Windows and Ansible. I might even pull out my Windows laptop and stream straight from it and see how that, how spectacularly that could fail. Uh, Ansible Tower in AWX, um, Ansible and Docker, Ansible and Kubernetes, and lots of different things that we can talk about. So there's definitely no lack of content. I think at some point I might have a pause after I cover most of the main parts of my book, and then I might do a new series after that focused on a specific topic, but we'll see. Uh, so those are questions and answers. Um, and uh, Devin in live chat is also asking about uh, deploying AWX on Kubernetes. Uh, it's funny you ask that. I actually am interested in the same thing, and that's why I have the tower operator, uh, which is right here. 
which deploys AWX on OCP or Kubernetes, uh, OpenShift. Um, and uh, you might be interested in that. It is not supported. It is not in an official installer, so don't, don't take it to production necessarily. But uh, it is the quickest way that I use to get Ansible Tower and AWX running. But we're not talking about that in, epi in this episode, so I'm not going to go too deep into that. Uh, we are talking about this episode, Ansible Galaxy. And uh, before I go too deep into that, I do want to mention, for many of these things, I have content outside of this live stream series. And even outside the book that talks about some of these topics more in depth. Uh, for example, I, I gave a presentation at Ansible Fest in 2019 in Atlanta. That was last year, back when we could meet together in person. And uh, it's called There's a Role for That, How to Evaluate Community Roles for Your Playbook. And I mentioned last week uh, that you had playbooks like, uh, here's a playbook that's a little different than last week, but I had a playbook that used Java and Solar, two roles that I maintain and lets you build a, a solar server that, that is built for search very quickly and easily using Ansible Community Galaxy roles. And um, uh, this presentation kind of goes through how do you evaluate roles and see if they're good for you or if you might not want to use that role, if they're well-maintained, all those kind of things. So you, you can go into there for more detail. But I did want to talk a little bit about Ansible Galaxy itself and uh, how, how you can get roles into your playbooks uh, from Ansible Galaxy, because I, I just showed you how to use it, but I didn't show you how to actually get the role to your computer. And the way that I recommend, um, th there are many different ways to get Ansible Galaxy roles locally. Uh, the easiest way is just use Ansible Galaxy install, actually, Ansible Galaxy role install, and then give it a role name that's on Ansible Galaxy. So this is, if I go to Ansible Galaxy, uh, galaxy.ansible.com, and search for homebrew. I should find my role somewhere up here. Here it is. So any role on Galaxy can be installed with this command. But if you just blindly run this command, it usually installs it into a global location. Like on my computer, I think it would install into slash Etsy slash Ansible slash role. So I don't want to do that because I might have different versions of the role for different playbooks. And I'll talk about why I do that in a second. But I like to install my roles local to the playbook, so in the same directory as my playbook. Um, so in this case, what I'm going to do is I always create an ansible.cfg file alongside a playbook. And in here, I give a roles path. Uh, and this file should have an extra line at the end, so the git doesn't complain. But uh, whoops, the roles path tells Ansible where to install and where to find roles. So right now, you can see there's no roles folder in here, but the roles path is set to that. So if I run this playbook with these two roles over here, uh, Ansible Galaxy, or Ansible Playbook, uh, and this is what, main.yaml. And I use it with dash K because I need to enter my become password on my Mac. It's not going to find that, that role because it's not found in the roles paths. This roles pass can be multiple paths. You can chain paths together if you want. Uh, but for playbooks, I typically like to only have it look for roles inside that playbook directory. Because if you look in a global location, the version of a role globally might be different than what you need for a particular playbook. And that can screw things up. So uh, what I want to do now is make sure that these roles are installed. And so you can add a requirements file, requirements.yaml, that lists all the roles that your playbook uses. And just like Python requirements, or just like a composer.json file in PHP, or uh, um, package info, I forget what it's called for NPM, Node.js. Somebody can throw it in, into live chat. Um, it, just like those, those list files, requirements lists a, a list of roles that you want to install. This can also list collections, which we aren't covering today. Uh, but uh, you, all you have to do in the requirements file is give a list of roles uh, with a name for each role. You can also provide a version if you want to lock it in at a certain version. So let's say I want to find this one. Uh, his command line tools are here on Galaxy. And the latest version is 2.3.0. So I can say version, whoops, version 2.3.0. And for my homebrew, uh, the latest version of that is I can just paste it in here and go to the URL. The latest version of this is 3.1.0. Save that file. And then in my 
terminal, I can run Ansible galaxy install dash r. Dash r says uh, a re pass it a requirements file, uh, requirements.yaml. And what that's going to do is download these two roles into a roles directory right here for me. And now I have those available, and I can run my playbook like this, providing my password so Ansible can store it in memory. And now it's running my playbook, which is configuring my local Mac uh, and making sure that PV is installed via Homebrew. And this is an extremely simple example of that Mac dev playbook that I maintain that maintains all the stuff on my computer. And uh, I highly recommend it. If you use more than one computer, it's nice to have an Ansible playbook that manages everything on that computer. And uh, if, you're, if you're interested in how that works, uh, Mac dev playbook is on GitHub right here. And it has a fancy logo with a little Ansible inside of a, a laptop. Um, but it, people can do the same very, the, the, the exact same thing on a, on a Linux machine. You could probably do it on Windows too, but it, it might be a little bit uh, more difficult to run from the same machine on Windows than it is on a Mac or Linux. Uh, so that's Git Galaxy. I just wanted to point that out and then also recommend this presentation. There's a role for that. Uh, and I'll, I'll paste a link in the chat uh, so that you can grab it there since you can't click on a link through my screen. And uh, you can go there and, and watch that episode or watch that, uh, that presentation later. I have the slides for it also up on my website, jeffgearling.com. So after the video's over, I, I might throw a link to that up in the description, uh, if I remember. Um, so anyway, that's Ansible Galaxy. There's a lot more to cover on it, and I, I, th I think I might do an episode on collections in Galaxy at some point in this live stream series. And at that point, I'll, I'll cover Galaxy a little bit more in depth. But I really wanted to get into testing Ansible. Um, and, and talk about that uh, today. So the first example I have is, uh, well, it, let me actually get started. So Galaxy was in uh, chapter six of my book. Uh, this is the book, Ansible for DevOps. You can get it at ansibleforDevOps.com and there's actually a link in the description right below. Um, but I was talking about Galaxy from chapter six uh, and we're actually skipping a few chapters. There's chapters on kind of Ansible cookbook, some different things you can do with Ansible to deploy applications. And I, I probably will take one of those and do it, use it as an example in, in one of the episodes coming up. And Devin says, will remind me about, uh, about putting that link in. Thank you very much. If you put a comment in, in this uh, video, I'll definitely remember. Um, and we're skipping a couple chapters. Uh, also a chapter on security, I'm gonna get to that later. Uh, but I, I skipped ahead to chapter 11 which in the current version of the book, version 1.22, is automating your automation Ansible tower with uh, CI CD. And originally I, I had a very short section on tower and then a long section on using Travis CI for testing your roles. But I, when I wrote that chapter originally, Ansible Lint didn't exist yet, Molecule didn't exist yet, I hadn't been using YAML Lint, and all of my testing was basically running a role in a Docker container and then rerunning it and making sure it worked. Uh, so since I wrote that chapter, so much has changed and the way that I do my testing has changed completely. So the chapter's a bit out of date. So you are seeing on this live stream, the first public uh, revelation of the new chapter 12, which is bumping chapter, the existing chapter 12 and 13 and 14 up one chapter. Uh, and I'm going to rewrite chapter 11 to cover Ansible Tower and AWX in more detail. And chapter 12 is going to be all about testing. Um, and uh, Vit Vitaly is asking about how to use Molecule with GitHub Actions. We're going to get there. Uh, don't worry. But we're going to start uh, with uh, what I call the Ansible testing spectrum and also discuss a little bit about what I, call, what I would call unit integration and functional testing in Ansible itself. Uh, so... With, with any testing, it's important to have different, uh, different layers of testing. Usually on the code level, so if I go to, um, if I go to this playbook that I have right here, uh, main.yaml, uh, the first level of testing for Ansible content is, does, is this valid YAML? So we want to we wanna check that. A second level would be, is this valid Ansible YAML? Is this a valid playbook? A third level would be, does this Ansible playbook run in a fresh environment? And a fourth level might be, uh, does, this, does this Ansible playbook run item potently and, and will run against production multiple times without breaking things? And then another level that most people don't necessarily need, but they might want, 
uh, is to have a parallel environment that's basically the same thing as production, so a staging environment or a pre-prod or something like that, and rebuild that environment from scratch every time you make a change to make sure that everything works correctly. Uh, or you can even have blue-green de production deployments. Um, and if you use something like Kubernetes, that's, that's even uh, easier nowadays to do. Uh, but I like to call this the Ansible testing spectrum, and I have this beautiful graphic over on the side here with the rainbow. I have no idea where I got that from, but this is a slide from a presentation I gave in 2018 on maintainable Ansible playbooks. And I mentioned playbooks because uh, that is the unit of automation that I think the, the most effort for testing should go into when you're building things. It's important to test roles individually. That's kind of like unit testing in code. Uh, but but it, at the playbook level, you really need to make sure that you have um, that you have that, that uh, vast testing level that is going to make sure you don't blow things up. And it starts at the top. This is the easiest thing to do and gives you a good bang for the buck, but may maybe not necessarily the most bang for the buck, is YAML int, which makes sure your YAML file is correct. The next thing is Ansible playbook with syntax check. Makes sure that the basic components of syntax work with Ansible, and Ansible can compile the playbook. That doesn't necessarily mean it's going to run, but at least it can, can see everything and, and not blow up. Then there's Ansible lint, uh, which tests for the YAML that's in your playbook to make sure it's compatible with best practices in Ansible. Again, it doesn't mean that it's going to run. It just means that it's good. Then there's Molecule Test, which is an integration test that runs your playbook against a fresh environment that we'll get into. Uh, then there's Ansible Playbook in check mode, which you can run against your production infrastructure to see, am I going to break anything with a change or something like that? And finally, there's that last step, uh, which is way more complex. And I rarely see this in practice unless you have infrastructure that has multiple millions of dollars uh, riding on it, uh, which is to build parallel infrastructure, test everything on it, and then uh, tear that infrastructure down, and then deploy to production. Uh, so this is the different ways that you can test Ansible. And I, I noticed, uh, thank you so much, uh, Guru. I, I can't pronounce your name. Guru, I'll call you Guru Prasad. Uh, thank you so much for the free books and the video series. You're very welcome. Um, and uh, and I also, I, I noticed a few people were asking questions in the live chat on different things. And uh, one really cool thing about doing these live streams is in the live chat, other people answer the questions other people ask, which is great. Because uh, there are some people in this live chat, believe it or not, that know a lot more than me about Ansible. Uh, but they, as with all of us, I think we all have stuff to learn every day. And... Uh, and if you don't learn something new every day, then, then you're either uh, fooling yourself or you need to uh, talk to more people and, and learn a little bit more. Anyway, uh, thank you for the people who answer things in live streams too, because uh, I, I can't always monitor the live chat. Uh, but if you do want to uh, get me to notice your comment really quickly, you can uh, hit that little, I don't, I don't know what the button is. There's a money button there. That'll definitely uh, flag my attention because it pops something up on my other screen. Um, anyway. Uh, so these are the different levels of Ansible testing, and uh, I'm, I'm just going to walk through each one. And you'll notice that each one is simpler than the others. And one of the things that I do in all these layers of testing is um, make sure that I also have tests built into Ansible. So in this new, new rewritten chapter, I have some text here talking about um, the best testing, really. And, and the most important thing is to make sure that your Ansible playbook itself does testing on the fly. So you can make sure that you're doing the right thing in the playbook itself. And uh, even if you don't do anything else, you can make sure that a web service is responding before you continue, or you can make sure that a port is open, or you can make sure that a file exists, all those kind of things. You can do that inline in an Ansible playbook using Ansible syntax, which is really easy. You don't have to have a separate tool that's written in Ruby or a separate Python thing running that you have to know a special syntax to use. So the, the first layer of that is a lot of times when I'm building a playbook, I just use the debug module. And the debug module just prints things to the screen. And uh, the debug module also has a setting for verbosity. So you can have it in here, and it won't always print out unless you add more verbosity to Ansible's verbosity. verbosity. I don't know how to pronounce that. But anyway, uh, it adds more. Uh, if, you, if you increase verbosity or verbosity, then, uh, then it'll print the debug message. If it's default, then it won't. Uh, but in this case, it'll always print this debug message here. 
And I've used this a couple times in live streams in the past. Uh, CD01, Ansible, Playbook, uh, what is this, debug.yaml. And you'll see that it uh, grabs it grabs uptime, registers the variable, and then it prints it out. Uh, and and you can also use uh, when clauses with debug to to show debug messages at certain points and and not at other points. Pretty simple. We've done this be before on this live stream series. And uh, but it is sometimes you forget like oh I just need to throw this value on the screen so that I can check it later. Debug is the simplest way to do that. You can also increase Ansible's verbosity to see the output of commands and things, but debug can be helpful uh, if you need to get the value of something or see what a variable structure is, that kind of thing. Uh, another pattern that, that uh, I use a lot is using the fail and assert modules. Uh, so I'm going to CD202. Uh, and then this playbook shows uh, the fail module and the assert module. And they're very similar in what they do. Uh, it's just a slightly different structure to it. So fail is always going to fail when it gets run. So if you use fail and win together, you can make your playbook fail at a certain point if a certain thing is triggered. So in the first case, I have should fail via fail true. And so that's going to trigger this. And the fail module is going to just fail the playbook at that point. So if I say ansible playbook fail assert, then it's going to fail right here an epic failure, as it were. But if I tell that to be false and say, whoops, and say that it should fail via assert, uh, then the assert module is going to, to assert that this, this variable should not, uh, should not equal true. And if it is true, then it's going to fail. Uh, so it's kind of like the inverse of fail, uh, and inverse of fail plus win. So in this case, it fails here, and it, it gives you the reason the assertion failed, and it gives you the assertion so you can see in a playbook uh, which assertion that you had uh, failed, so you can see how to fix that. Um, so I'm going to set that to false and pop down here and say this true. Whoops, I can't spell today. There we go. Uh, and this assert uses multiple conditions. So I, again, this is it's, it's kind of the same thing as fail plus win. It just depends on how your brain's working that day. I use both all the time. Uh, assert is probably a little bit more formal. And it probably should be used more for asserting different things are happening in your infrastructure. But you could have something like a command that returns output and it checks uh, that, that something is in it. So you can have assert that this thing, this string is in this output. Or you could assert that this port is open or assert that there's this content in a web response. Different things like that. And you can do that inline in your playbook to make sure that before the playbook progresses further, uh, something that you expect to happen happened. So that's testing inline in your, in your playbook. Uh, now, getting to the actual test spectrum, so once you have a playbook that's running, uh, there are some things that are really nice to do, and this is a little confusing for me because I accidentally printed this double-sided, and these pages are all, like, it's upside down. So I will be fumbling around a little bit with these pages since they're not in a nice book format yet because I can't magically print books at my home during, during this time. Um, let me also, I need to switch my monitor over here too because I can't see. Okay. Uh, so the next thing is YAMLint, and YAMLint, uh, YAMLint will quickly help you weed out any YAML issues. And so one reason I like to use this is because it's it's often the case that you have uh, a playbook that runs, but you have some spacing issues or other little issues that can lead to problems in the future. Uh, because you might you might go to a, a level in the playbook and then press enter and then your code editor puts you in the wrong tab level or something like that. Uh, so it's important to, to have spacing correct in YAML, just like with Python. And if you have the spacing incorrect, that can lead to problems in the future. So YAMLint is basically giving a set of, of guidelines for YAML files that are nice to have and applying them to your, to your actual playbook. Uh, so this playbook here, I'm going to run it, and uh, it should work, I believe. So if I say cd03 yamlint uh, ansible playbook uh, lint example, uh, it still runs. So it's a working playbook, but there are a few issues with it. And the eagle-eyed among you may have already found some of those issues. If you want to feel really smart and stuff, you can stick that in the live chat and, and uh, show everybody how you know everything about YAML Int without even running it. Uh, thank you, Ross. Um, thank you very much. 
the, someone else hit that little dollar button and see, I, I see it right away because it pops up on that other screen. Um, so anyway, uh, to get YAML int, it's just like with all the other Python tools you use around Ansible, uh, you use pip to install it. So I'm going to say pip3 install YAML int. And hopefully this doesn't uh, blow up my computer. I know for, for my Drupal live streams, GitHub has been down two times out of the 13 live streams I've done. So uh, it's always risky doing things over the internet. Uh, but YAML int is installed, and now I can just run YAML int and then give it this current directory, and it'll give us some of these things here. And uh, so a lot of these things are just like document start is probably not that important, but I still like being more formal about it because you know this is a YAML document if you give that, that three line start. So we'll do that and fix that. Um, it, it noticed there's a trailing space which in my code editor is easy to see because I use a, uh, a plugin called trailing spaces to highlight those. But we can get rid of that. That makes things a little more clean. Uh, too few spaces before comment. This is just a, a code style thing. There should be at least two spaces before comments in YAML documents. That makes it a little more apparent that it's a comment, especially when you're in a system that doesn't highlight the comments like my, my code editor is doing. Also, uh, this is something that I see all too often uh, when I'm linting other people's Ansible playbooks. A lot of times, they, if somebody uses the space bar to make tabs uh, like this, uh, which is something that uh, in Silicon Valley annoys me to no end, because people who use spaces for tabs don't use the space bar. They don't go space, 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 space like that. They use tab, and they have a code editor that has a tab width setting. Anyway, I digress. Um, I am a spaces over tabs person. I'm also a Vim over Emacs person, and I probably just lost half the audience. But anyways, um, uh, so that, that it found that there was a space missing right here, so I put that in. And, uh, but there's one value here that in the Drupal, in, in, not Drupal, I'm confusing myself since I talk, mentioned it about the uh, other, other live stream I'm doing. In the Ansible ecosystem, a lot of people use uh, yes or no, or even on or off, but mostly yes or no. Um, uh, for playbooks for uh, Boolean values in, in YAML, and that's perfectly valid. You can see my code editor, editor even highlights it as a Boolean here. And, uh, but YAML int's default rules don't account for that. So it's nice to be able to tell uh, YAML int, and let me flip over my page here so I can actually see it. Uh, it's nice to be able to tell YAML int, hey, it, it's okay to use yes and no. Uh, but I, st I still do want to make sure that Booleans are a certain type of value, uh, yes, no, true, false, and not just anything under the sun. Because technically, I think you can also use zero or one but that can also be a, a challenge when you're dealing with integers versus Boolean. So I like to limit it to false, true, yes or no, basically. And we can tell YAML int that using a YAML int file. So first, I fix those other issues. Let's run YAML int again. And this is the only issue it's picking up now. So I'm going to create a YAML int file. So I'll save this as .yaml lint. I use dot, yes. Uh, in this YAML int file, I'm going to put extends default. Uh, that means that it's going to use the default rules that YAML int ships with. But I'm going to add in a setting for the truthy rule. And you notice that this is YAML, so you can use YAML to configure YAML int. It's always fun like that. Loud values. And then I can give it a list of true, oops, false, which are the ones that it ships with. And then I'm also going to add in yes and no, and save that file. And now, if I run it again, it gives me no errors. And if I say echo uh, the, the RC, it's going to be zero. So in, in CI, uh, if you have your CI environment set up to run YAML int on your playbook, it'll return an error if there's any, uh, if there's any errors or warnings in, in the YAML int. But it'll return zero. Uh, and pass if there are no problems. So I usually throw YAML int and CI pretty quick because it's it's a quick and easy way to make your, your playbooks all look pretty uniform and have all the right YAML things like the dashes to start it, the right spacing, and the right indentation. Uh, so and the next step beyond that is uh, dot dot oh, 04. The next step beyond that is to do an Ansible syntax check. And this is pretty, it's, it's a pretty easy, free way to get uh, another level of testing done for your playbooks in CI, and it's super quick. It takes maybe a second or two at most uh, to run. 
even for a pretty complex playbook. And what this will do is it'll check if Ansible can basically put everything together. Like it, it, when, it, when you run an Ansible playbook, it has to put together all the in, imported tasks and playbooks. It has to make sure that all the modules are findable. It, it makes sure that variables are formatted correctly for Ansible. So in addition to being valid YAML, is it a valid basic Ansible playbook? And if I run that here, uh, Ansible playbook, uh, what is this called? Syntax check, syntax check like this with the flag. Um, it finds quickly, oh, oops, I don't have a free.yaml file. So it's trying to import this file, but it doesn't exist. So, okay, I'll fix that and I'll run this again. And it looks like I'm good, right? Unfortunately, syntax check is not super intelligent uh, because it's not actually running the playbook. Some things like dynamic includes, so if you use include tests instead of import tests, that's a dynamic operation that, that happens at the runtime of the playbook. So syntax check can actually check some of those types of things, or if you have dynamic variables that use set fact to set them, that kind of thing. It can't be 100% correct, so that, you know this should actually be date.yaml, because if I do it like this and run the playbook without syntax check, it's going to fail right here, uh, even though the syntax check passed. But if I do it with date, then I can run it and it'll pass. So syntax check is just, it's nice to give a basic level of can Ansible compile this stuff together? It's not much beyond that. It's not checking if, if the playbook actually runs or if everything that's listed in the playbook can be accessed. So just keep that in mind. It's, it's not a, a golden panacea for, for your testing. Uh, let me figure out what page I'm on in here and try to get to the next one with all these flippy pages. Uh, so the next thing I want to talk about is Ansible int. So there's YAML int for the YAML, basic YAML stuff. Ansible int uh, can also test Ansible tasks and playbooks to make sure that, that there's um, that kind of the best practices for formatting tasks and writing playbooks are followed. There's, it's not a full breadth of everything in Ansible, but it, there are a lot of things that, that can help you avoid pitfalls or avoid um, bad practices like using the shell module instead of the command module. Uh, so we'll go over to that example, Ansible int uh, 05, Ansible int. And if I run this playbook, it does work. So Ansible playbook main.yaml. Uh, it works correctly and gives me the output I want. I can also run uh, YAML int on it. And YAML int, oh, ha, YAML int did find one error, so let me pop that in there. So YAML int passes, and if I run the playbook, it works. Uh, but there are some things in here that I can do a little bit better. Uh, so first of all, I'm going to install Ansible int, which is just like all these other tools you install it using pips. I'm going to say pip3 install Ansible int. And I just realized I have my mail open. I should probably quit that. Um, and now Ansible int's installed. So I'm going to run Ansible int on it as well. So Ansible lint. And then this is main.yaml. Uh, one quick note on running Ansible int. You can pass it a playbook or a role specifically, or if you're in a Git repository, you can have it auto-detect playbooks and things. Uh, but for, for, best, for, for best compatibility, just pass it the playbook that you want to check. Uh, so I ran it on here, and there are three different things that found uh, in, in the playbook that uh, could be correct. It could be more correct. So one thing is, this task is not named, so why am I doing this? I, you know, I, in, in my case, I'm doing this just to demonstrate a playbook running on my local machine, but it's not obvious because there's no documentation for it. So it is correct. I should put name uh, git system uptime to demo how this works. So I fixed that issue, um, which is right here, 502, all tasks should be named. Uh, another thing here is saying use shell only when shell functionality is required. This is just running a command. It's not using pipes, like it's not piping that through something and then using awk or anything like that. It's also not using uh, and and. It's not you know it's not doing anything that this sh that the shell module is really required for. So it's better to use command uh, to to do those kind of things. So I'm going to switch that to command. And then also uh, this 301 says commands should not change things if nothing is doing. That's it's kind of a funny way to say that, but basically uh, Ansible will always report this as changed. And I know that when I run the uptime command, I'm not changing anything on the system. Uh, so I can put here changed when false. 
And now if I run this playbook again, or if I run Ansible Lint again, it won't find any issues. Sometimes, so there's a list here, uh, Ansible Lint, uh, what is it, uh, rules. Uh, there's a list in the documentation, I think it's under here, of all these different rules. Uh, it doesn't have it here, but there is documentation for Ansible, and here's the default rules. Uh, a few of these rules are a little bit more strict than I think I care about. Uh, what is it? Uh, 50... Uh, what is it? Where is it? Uh, there's something about, like, uh, changed... Uh, let's see, commands... Ah, so 503. I, I often ignore 503 because sometimes you do have a playbook where you want to do something, and if that thing results in a change, do something else immediately. And this has a rule in here that says if you use changed in a when clause, so if I say, like, when, uh, when system uptime.changed, I believe that this is going, or, or is changed, I could use too. If I do that, it's going to pop this up. Uh, so you know, a lot of times it is better to use a handler for something that happens after something changes, but if I needed to happen immediately, uh, it's nice to just be able to do it immediately. And so you can ignore that using uh, the, the ignore syntax, or you can also create an, a dot Ansible lint file to ignore something like that. Um, but just something to keep in mind. Ansible lint doesn't mean uh, if, you, if you don't do it the way that Ansible lint wants you to do it, you're bad. In some cases, it's perfectly okay to do that. And that's all these lint tools, they give you suggestions. It's not concrete and you have to do it. Uh, but um, but these, these three tools, YAML lint, syntax check, and Ansible lint are all great to throw into any CI for any playbook just to make sure you have a uniform set of rules and set of um, guidelines for writing your, your syntax. And that also helps other developers who might not be as familiar with YAML if you're on a team, those other developers will have to kind of pass that gate to make sure that their code lives up to the same standards and is formatted similarly. Otherwise, you end up with playbooks that look like this. And uh, over time, you know, this, this isn't a huge deal uh, because it's, it works. But over time, what happens is you start getting the wrong indentation level and it gets harder to figure out where you are in the playbook and what you're doing. Uh, and, and it gets really messy. So using these organizational tools uh, to lint and check your code is really helpful. Now, uh, we've gotten through those things. Those are on, if I go back over to my, to my Ansible testing spectrum, those are all in the top three. And the bottom three are where, where kind of the rubber meets the road, where things start, getting, uh, things start getting a lot more useful, but also a bit more difficult. And Molecule, I wouldn't call it difficult necessarily. I, I would just say that uh, it is very broad and you can do a lot of things with it. And because of that, the documentation can be extremely daunting. I know uh, the first thing that a lot of people do is they go to Molecule's documentation and they, they glance at something like the, uh, the Getting Started Guide. And some of these things, it's just a lot to see in the, in the first run through. And I, I know that uh, the people who maintain Molecule, the, the people who are few and, and proud and do a lot of great things, uh, they have spent a lot of time trying to get these doc docs a little bit better. Uh, but I think in the past, especially, it was even more daunting and challenging because the documentation wasn't organized in a way that, that was really targeted at somebody brand new to it. So that's one of the goals of this video is to help dispel that myth. Like, Molecule is actually a very simple tool. And the cool thing is, uh, so let me actually get to my section in my, my pre-production first ever seen uh, copy of Chapter 12. Um, uh, basically, one of the things that I used to do when I was testing playbooks and developing them and, and trying to build them the first time is I would build a VM somewhere, whether it's in Vagrant and VirtualBox on my local computer or on Amazon EC2 or something like that. Uh, then I'd set up SSH so I can connect to it. I'd create an inventory file uh, so that my Ansible playbook can connect to the VM. Uh, and also, if I had a production playbook, I'd make sure that it, it was not connecting to production. Uh, that can really trip you up if you accidentally do that. Uh, and then I'd run the playbook against the VM. I'd test and validate things. I'd do some development work. And then at the end of it, I would delete the VM. And it's a really heavyweight operation, especially if you maintain a lot of different things like I do. Uh, but even if you only maintain a few different Ansible playbooks, it's a lot of work just to, you know, it, it might take you five or 10 minutes to just get set up or 30 minutes or an hour if you forgot your login or you got to get your two-factor password for Amazon to get your VM running. 
all these different things. And Vagrant helps a bit. So in, in some of the examples in the book, we've used Vagrant to build a VM and run an Ansible playbook on it. And that's nice, but it still is a little bit heavyweight. Uh, and so that's uh, that. at that point in my time using Ansible, I started writing a shell script. And the shell script, I believe, is still out there. If I go to gist.github.com and search for Ansible tests or something like that. Uh, oh, I, I, well, I'm not going to find it that quickly. But I have a gist out there that has the script. And it's kind of beastly. And it, and it added support for more operating systems and things. It worked, and it, it was great, but it, it didn't have a lot of pluggability. It wasn't extremely maintainable, and it was a shell script. And it's like, I'm writing all this automation for my infrastructure, but my testing is based on a shell script. So uh, right around that time was when Molecule started to uh, become more than just like a little side project for someone and, and got a lot of uptake. And I decided to start moving all of my Ansible roles to use it, and then I realized it's it's not great just for role testing. It's great for playbook testing. And I also use it now for testing my Ansible operators in Kubernetes. Molecule can plug right into Kubernetes, running a local cluster and, and testing things in there. Uh, it's basically a way to use Ansible to set up a test environment, to run an Ansible playbook, and then do tests on that Ansible environment, and then tear it down all using Ansible. Uh, it uses some Python, of course, on the back end because it's written in Python, but, uh, but it's, it's mostly Ansible, and it, it's pretty approachable from that perspective. Uh, and to get it, you just need to run. Uh, let me go into that folder, 06 molecule, uh, pip3 install molecule. Uh, you just install it with pip3 install molecule. And uh, there's a few different ways to use molecule. So it was initially built with just Ansible roles in mind. But it, it can be used for a lot more than that today, since I don't have the time to get deep into all the ways to use Molecule. And I think I might uh, break that out into another session next week, right? I show how I use it in some of my other projects. Um, but it, roles are the kind of the simplest and easiest way to demonstrate how quick it is to get started with Molecule. So I'm going to uh, use Molecule's built-in command, which is Molecule init role, and then give it a role name. And this is the exact same thing as running uh, Galaxy or Ansible Galaxy init uh, role in it, I think, my role. So if I do that, uh, Ansible Galaxy will create my role. It has the typical Ansible Galaxy role structure. Uh, it includes all the different things we talked about last week. Uh, and But in the end, what's really required for a role is just tasks and a meta slash main.yaml with dependencies listed. Um, and it gives you this role structure. I'm going to delete that, uh, my role. And I'm going to use molecules command, which is the exact same, but with molecule. So molecule uh, role init <laughs> my role. And that's going to create the exact same role structure uh, init role. OK. That's something we might want to change in molecule itself, init role. Uh, there we go. Because Molecule, like I said, it was built just for roles, but now we have collections too. So at some point, we'll probably have Molecule do collection in it as well. Anyway, so it created this role, and it's the exact same as the role that we created with Galaxy. However, there's one minor difference. You might notice that there's a Molecule directory. And this is all that's required uh, to test with Molecule. You just have to have a Molecule directory. And inside that directory, you have one or more scenarios. Molecule ships with one default scenario, but you can have uh, like you could have a scenario that tests in one condition, a, a scenario that tests in another. For example, with my tower operator that I mentioned at the beginning of this video, uh, I test it in one scenario. It tests using a kind cluster, which is local Docker-based Kubernetes and Docker cluster. Uh, but there's another scenario that can run it on on uh, Minikube, which is a different way of running a, a local Kubernetes cluster. So you can have different scenarios for different environments, or you can have different scenarios for different types of use of your playbook or role. Uh, however you want to do that is, is up to you. In, the most, in most cases, I just have one scenario, which is like the default way to use this role. And then I might have a playbook that can go different ways depending on environment variables, something like that. Uh, but it gives you one default scenario. And it gives you four files in here. This file just shows you how to set things up so that you can run uh, so that you can run Molecule, but we already did that by installing Molecule. Uh, then there's a molecule.yaml file. This describes how Molecule is going to run tests. 
And at a very basic level, it, it gives you a few different things. One is dependency uh, dependency management. This is always going to be, almost always going to be at Ansible Galaxy, at least in all my examples. Uh, and then it uses a driver for running the tests. So in this case, we're going to use Docker, and that's the default. It's going to create a Docker instance locally, and it's going to run the run our tests inside that instance, and then it's going to delete it. And that's you, you can also find uh, drivers for VirtualBox and uh, Amazon EC2 and, and other ones so that you can build instances there and run the tests in them. Uh, and then it gives you uh, it gives you a little bit of control over how it runs inside Docker. And uh, next episode, I'll get into a lot more detail on how you can do more advanced things with this. Uh, but by default, it's going to run a CentOS container and let you test inside of it. Obviously, if you're building for Ubuntu, you're not going to want to use CentOS. So it'd be good to cover uh, how you can test in different platforms and different uh, distribution versions, which I'll cover next episode. And then it gives you a provisioner. This is typically going to be Ansible because we're testing Ansible stuff. Um, that's that's pretty simple. And then finally, a verifier that's going to run after everything is set up uh, so that you can test that everything's working correctly. And by default, that's also Ansible. So you can run a playbook to test your Ansible playbook. Uh, in some cases, that might be redundant. If your playbook already does all the testing that you care about, making sure that things are running correctly, then that's great. But a lot of people also want to run extra tests to kind of check that the whole system's working the way that they expect afterwards. And so, uh, the other two files go along with this. Converge.yaml is a playbook. It's a very simple playbook, and all it does is run the role that Molecule just set up for you. So this is my role, and this playbook is going to run my role. That's all. And uh, this, this, by the way, is equivalent to running uh, roles my role. Uh, so we could delete that, and it, it's a super simple playbook. The, the main thing is it's called converge.yaml because Molecule converges everything together through this playbook. So if you had other setup steps in, uh, to get your role working, you could run them here. So you know, if, you're, if you're on Ubuntu, a lot of times you might need to make sure that the apt cache is updated. So you could say apt uh, update cache equals yes, and, and then give it a cache lifetime. So you can change this playbook to do whatever, and, Mole and Molecule will run that. Um, uh, run this playbook whenever it sets up your environment. Then the verify playbook lets you test things inside of that that environment. So this is just asserting that true is true, which is pretty pointless. Uh, but we'll get uh, we'll see how far we can get with testing an actual real world case here. But just to demonstrate, um, I'll save all these defaults and we can run a molecule test, and that's going to do all the different steps, which. Uh, did I change something in here? I didn't. Molecule glob failing. Oh, I'm not in. I'm not actually in the directory, so I need to cd into my role, and then run molecule test. And molecule is going to find that that configuration, and then it starts doing different things. I'll I'll go back here. So it's showing you uh, the full matrix of all the things it's going to try to do. Some of these things it won't need to do because it doesn't have any Ansible Galaxy dependencies to install, so you can see it's skipping that, missing the file. Uh, there's no cleanup playbook that we have custom. Typically, I don't have this for my roles. Uh, linting is disabled because there's no linting configuration here. All these different things. Uh, but what it does here is it hits... Um, first, it makes sure that the instance doesn't exist because it wants a clean environment. And then it creates the environment. This is uh, uh, building that, that Docker environment right here, creating the molecule instance. Again, this is all using Ansible. Uh, so it's kind of nice in that regard that you use Ansible to build the environment that you're going to run your playbook in, and then you use Ansible to tear it down. Uh, then uh, there's no prepare playbook, so it skips that. Then it hits converge, where it runs this playbook right here. You can see it's including my role. That's what it does right here. And then uh, my role actually has nothing in it because it's empty, so there's, there's no tasks. And then at the end, it... Uh, it checks for item potent, so it runs it again, and as long as there's no changes, so it checks that there's changed equals zero, and it didn't fail. And if that completes successfully, then item potents test pass. Then there's a side effect playbook that we don't uh, care about here, and then for verify, it runs this verify uh, playbook right here. And then at the end, it's going to clean up that environment and throw it away. 
One thing that I do a lot when I'm uh, building my Ansible roles, especially, but also playbooks, is I want to have an environment that I can dive into and look like when I have a configuration file that I'm editing. I want to jump in there before that configuration file is edited to see what it was before. And then I want to edit it, and then I want to um, edit it with Ansible. And then I want to see what it is after and all that kind of stuff. So if you run molecule test, it'll create the environment, run the stuff, and whether it passes or fails, it tears it all down and it's gone. And you're like, okay, I guess I can't do anything now because I, I don't know what failed. Uh, so uh, one of the patterns that I use a lot, so I'm, I'm going to change this role. In the role, we're going to make my role install Apache. So I'm going to say name uh, install Apache. Uh, and then we'll use yum since we're on CentOS. Uh, name httpd state present. All right, so now we're going to have install uh, Apache installed on the server. So I'm going to say uh, something different than molecule test. I'm going to run molecule converge. And that does everything that molecule test is doing. Uh, but the, the main benefit is it will stop at this point. Uh, it won't run the item potence test. It won't destroy the environment. It won't run the verify. Uh, but it'll run my playbook. It'll run my converge playbook. And it'll run my role. And I can stop it at that point and start looking at what I'm doing. So if I run molecule converge, uh, it'll run all the way up to that point. So it'll first create uh, the Docker instance that it's going to run. And then after the instance creates, which should be pretty quick since our, it's already downloaded the image, uh, it'll run the converge playbook. And we should see that it installs Apache at this point. And that might take a few seconds. I know on my old laptop, this would have crushed it, and it would have completely died at this point. All right. OK, so at this point, it stops. And uh, if I look at Docker, let me make this bigger so you can see it. If you look at Docker PS, you can see that there's an instance running here. I'll make this wider so it shows up. There's an instance here running, uh, and it just runs using uh, while true to keep this container running so Molecule can keep working on it. I can run Molecule Converge again, and it'll just run that playbook again on it. But the cool thing is now I can say um, docker exec-it um, to attach to it, uh, and then the instance ID, which is instance, or I can use the container ID 331. Uh, so I'm going to say instance. Um, and then bin bash. That'll drop me into the container. And now I can CD into my Apache configuration directory. Uh, and I can look around at what's in there. So cd config.d, uh, cat welcome.config. Uh, so if I wanted to, I can grab this out of here. I can uh, put it into a template. I can change things. So I can dig into the server while I'm managing it. Uh, and uh, another thing that I do a lot while I'm doing that is if I have a full playbook that I know, like let's say I do have a task that says uh, copy uh, source uh, file dot config dest is let's see httpd config dot d slash what is this welcome dot config. If I know that I have this coming up and I don't want it to hit there, I'll just throw in a fail, save that, and then if I run this. It'll get up to this fail and stop. And then I can go into the container that I'm in, look at the, the files that are in there, make changes, uh, change my playbook around. And then when I'm ready, see how it failed uh, before it hit this task. Then I'm, when I'm ready, I just take this task out. Kind of like, you know, I might be crucified for being uh, not, not formal about this, but it's kind of like throwing a breakpoint in your playbook to be able to debug things. Uh, tossing the fail module in and using molecule converge. So I often do that a number of times uh, when, I am, uh, when I'm doing this. Oh, and somebody mentioned, I did not know this. Let's see if this actually works. You can use molecule login. That is cool. I had no idea. I have a little, so on my computer, this is, this is why I love the live stream. So if I say, uh, I have a, a, a little uh, a bash alias set up for d enter that does the docker exec IT. And then I can say deenter instance. And I've been doing that forever. And uh, molecule login just does it automatically. So let me exit out of here. Um, that's cool. Thank you very much. Who was that? Mike Sawyers. Thank you. 
So you can use molecule login to drop into the instance. That's like a million times better. And that actually makes a lot of sense because molecule knows how to connect to it. So molecule would be able to do that. So you can log into it using molecule login, keep using molecule converge over and over again, uh, drop breakpoints using the fail module in your playbook uh, where you want it to stop. Um, and, and if you want also in the playbook, you can use debug to debug what variables available. So I could say uh, debug, let's see, I can say uh, register yum debug r equals yum. So I can do that and, and throw it into a converge cycle to see what a variable has in it. Uh, so it's, it's really helpful for that. It's, it's like the, the, test, the testing development feedback loop that I use locally. And uh, you can see that this, this actually failed because there's no file for that. Uh, but anyway, uh, that, so that's how I use Molecule to do my local testing and, and that, that test, test develop and, and fix things and, and go back into it loop. When you're finished with it, you can run Molecule destroy and that'll delete everything. And with all the other actions too, you can run Molecule dependency to reinstall dependencies from Galaxy. If you have any, you can run Molecule verify to run the verifier playbook. All these different steps uh, can be called individually too. Um, anything uh, here? So, so next episode, I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, how I use Molecule with all my roles to run on multiple operating systems. And we'll get into how to use Molecule in CI in, in an environment like GitHub Actions. Uh, because I, I use Travis CI for a lot of things. I use GitHub Actions for a lot of things. And I use Jenkins for some things. And uh, I use Tower for a lot of running playbooks, but I, I, I'm not sure if, uh, if many people use Tower with Molecule to run tests and CI for playbooks, but I typically use a CI platform like uh, Travis or, or GitHub Actions. But um, that will be for next episode. And we'll also talk a little bit about um, Ansible's check mode and running against production. And I won't have time in this live stream series for sure to talk about the full, uh, and the full option of parallel infrastructure, because that's that's something that I could cover in like a, a two or three week long course, probably, but not in a one hour live stream for sure. Uh, but I am glad that you came today. I hope you liked this episode and I hope that it has inspired you to maybe do a little bit more, more Ansible testing and get your playbooks uh, to be more uniform, more testable, more, uh, more able to be shared uh, with a team and, and stable and maintainable. And again, uh, I, I mentioned that uh, the, the maintainable playbooks uh, presentation that I had, I'll, I'll put a link to that in the description, along with uh, a link to the uh, slides from the, the other presentation I mentioned earlier. <clears throat> and as I said at the beginning of the video, please consider, if you can, uh, supporting me on GitHub or Patreon. You can see my I'm, I'm Gearling Guy all over the place. So just search for Gearling Guy and, and you can find me. Uh, and that'll help me keep... Uh, being able to do these videos and keep improving this book. I put up a blog post last week that I, uh, for the months of March and April, I, I gave away somewhere around 60,000 copies of Ansible for DevOps and Ansible for Kubernetes. And it's, it's awesome. And I also saw an increase in sales, which is great. But that's also 60,000 people who might never pay for the book in the future. So um, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, by doing some of this content and also uh, you know, being able to be sponsored on GitHub and things like that, that'll help offset any potential loss in revenue from that. Uh, but thank you for watching. Next week, it'll be the same time, same place. Uh, please subscribe to the YouTube channel and you'll be able to see uh, when I start talking about this Turing Pi cluster. The first episode from that intro to clustering is already up and live, so you can go back in my YouTube channel and find that. The next episode I have almost ready to go. I'm going to talk about setting up the hardware and comparing it to my my current existing cluster, the Raspberry Pi Dramble, which uses four Raspberry Pis with power over Ethernet. Uh, and then we'll be talking about running Kubernetes with K3S on it. So I am glad that you guys came today. I hope that you are having a good week and please stay safe, especially as, as things start opening. Please uh, try to make sure that you're um, maintaining social distancing and, uh, and being kind to your neighbors. Thank you very much.